they're saying we have matured enough, we can look after our own, our own problems, whether they be political or financial, and we can do it in a manner that is diplomatic or friendly. Instead of using the power of the dollar and America's military prowess. Welcome back to Soar Financially, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. And we have a fantastic conversation lined up today. We're going to talk geopolitics. And the, the topic of the conversation today, today is going to be how does ge or how do the geopolitics affect financial policies? As you all know, like the mantra of our channel is to understand the macro or to discuss the macro to understand the micro better. Really, really important discussion to be had because a lot of our discussions here on the channel are very US centric. And I think it's really important to zoom out to understand what is happening on a global scale. Lots happening. BRICS is one buzzword that has you know, been going around the news uh, lately. So we'll, we'll dive into that and see how the upcoming meeting on August 26th might reshape the financial world. Lots going on, and uh, I've got a fantastic guest on. But before I switch over to my guest, subscribe to the channel. 80 to 85% of you watching are not subscribed. It helps us tremendously bring guests like Simon Hunt on the channel even more frequently and just broaden our reach. We really appreciate it. Now, I've said enough. Let me switch over to my guest. It's Simon Hunt of Simon Hunt Strategic Services, and I'm really excited to have him on. I've had the pleasure of watching a few of your interviews, Simon, lately, and I'm excited to have one with you right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Oh, absolutely. No, looking forward to having this because, as I said, we're going to zoom out a little bit. A lot of geopolitics today, uh, just to understand what is happening in the U.S. or just on the financial on the, in the financial landscape. And uh, I'm going to ask a very broad question to start us off, Simon. Is uh, what are the, some of the top geopolitical trends you're following these days? Let, let's start there. Well, I think the the fundamental trend is how the world is being divided into two blocks. Um, first, you have the dollar-dominated world of the G7, and now you have the growing, what I describe, what I call the new world of BRICS+. Plus. Um, there's an important meeting coming up um, uh, later in, in August, where there should be gathering not just the five BRICS members, but probably another 30 odd countries. And if you add them all up, they account for something like 35% of global GDP and about 60% of the world's population. What uh, they are busy evolving is a multilateral world as opposed to America's unilateral world. And where over time they will develop a currency uh, that will become universal to the BRICS members, who probably by 2030 will be accounting for most countries outside the G7. And they will develop a separate currency to the US dollar, which will probably be gold-backed. But initially, the development is going to be how they, their members and other countries can settle trade outside the US dollar. And they will probably do that by setting up their own payment messaging systems so that trade does not have to go through the SWIFT by using the US dollar, 
We've recently seen some very big deals being conducted between the UAE and India, where they ha where they are using or will be using their own payment messaging systems, and therefore without the need of settling trade with US dollars. So that's that's the big the big picture. Then we have to look at um, the the rivalries that have already been created between America and members of BRICS, such as China and Russia. So that takes us to the war over Ukraine, because you need to go back to at least 1991, if not the end of World War II, to appreciate that America's long-term strategy has always been to dismember Russia so that America can control Russia's massive natural resource reserves. More recently, that policy has been added to by America trying to break down the growing alliance between Germany, Russia, and China. Because to go back to Halford Mackinder's words in 1904, he who controls the heartland controls the world. And that was one of the basic principles of Brzezinski's foreign policy towards Russia and China. So America has in the short term anyway, been successful in breaking that alliance. One way was to destroy Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, which all the evidence points towards a US stroke UK operation. How long America will be successful in breaking up that alliance is a different question. And then the second part of this um, growing disarray is that it's pretty clear that American policy is to contain China's growth at any cost. And if you go back in history, whenever one emperor has ruled the world and an emerging one arises, then the existing emperor saps down the emerging one. And that's what we are in, we are now seeing. And again, the question is, how will they be successful if they will be? So that's really the big broad picture of what's happening geopolitically in the world. There are several subdivisions to that. Um, Iran being an important one, Taiwan being another important one. So one could carry on. Absolutely. And there, there, as you said, there's a lot going on. But I really appreciate that summary because it's very high, high level. It touched on a lot of things I think we need to dive deeper on. And uh, I'm probably going to start with the BRICS meeting as well. And uh, maybe as a, as a question to decide, like France tried to join that meeting. 
So I'm uh, trying to figure out like how that fits in, and like, what's your opinion on that? Why why was Macron really trying to get an invitation to that meeting? What what was the purpose of that? A very good question, and one can only guess the answer because I don't have any inside information on that. But I suspect that um, the French president understands which way the wind is blowing and is trying to get a seat at the BRICS table in order to balance French policy between America, the, the old world, as it were, and the new world, which is emerging. So he was rebuffed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they didn't want him in Johannesburg. Absolutely. So really curious because Germany's trying to make a bit of a, I wouldn't say foray, but they're trying to reestablish some relationships with China as well, especially if we look at uh, economic relationships. Well, I mean, this is this goes back to um, many decades ago where German business people saw future growth being in the East and not in the West. And that is still their view. The problem is their political masters are basically bought by Washington, just as the whole of the EU is. So they're caught between what they want to do and what they can't do. But it's very interesting that you've had a number of German business people visiting China recently. Uh, Germany's biggest chemical company, Bass, is proceeding with its $10 billion investment in China. So I suspect that within three years, not only will we have a different government in China, but I suspect that the EU will be on its the um, the EU will be on its last legs. I I see Europe being as we have a major economic and financial crisis starting to appear within three years. I think that will be the death knell of the European Commission as it currently stands. I think we should go back to um, countries running, looking after their own affairs. You can see the people are, are revolting against the orders which come out of Brussels. So that's another one of the big long-term trends. Just on a bit more micro scale, we're seeing that in Germany right now, where the right wing AFD party is uh, pretty much catching up or on par now with the uh, with the CDU, the the conservative yeah. party here as well. So I think that's that's an underlying trend. And you mentioned countries managing their own affairs. This week was the first time I read about Dexit, meaning a German Brexit, <laughs> a German exit from the EU. So. That is, it was just one of the topics. Well, I think you, there was a leading indicator of that when the Bundesbank a couple of months ago actually said, we can no longer afford to finance the rest of the EU. In other words, sorry, guys, um, you're not going to get any more money from us. No, that's... Uh... I mean, the transfer <laughs> payments that... that Germany has made to the rest of the EU, EU, I forget the number, but it's massive. We'll never recover that either. So no, of course not. It's gone. Absolutely. So I, I, th I think we're seeing that here as well, because our GDP or debt to GDP ratio is 70% roughly. I think it's 68, 69. So, and we don't want that spiraling out of control either. There, there are limits. I think we're a little more frugal or financially, what do you call it, uh, literate 
than maybe other countries when it comes to that. I think we're a bit more conservative. So correct. And yeah. we've seen that in, in in policies from Merkel go, or even going back further. So um, I want I want to keep I want to zoom back out again. I think we should stay on that BRICS meeting for for a minute because I think it might be quite pivotal. Um, funny enough, it's at the same week or the same day the uh, the Fed is having their Jackson Hole meeting as well. So I, th I thought it was funny when I saw Sorry, this. Who's having the, the Fed is having their Jackson oh, yeah, Hole yeah, conference. Yeah, 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 so yeah, I thought yeah, that was interesting, yeah. uh, both on August 26th, right? But um, what, what do you expect well, coming actually, out of that? So actually, the BRICS meeting is August 22 to 24. Oh, okay. I thought for some reason I had the 26th. If, that doesn't matter. That, that week in August. So it's even, even more interesting because now the Fed – Paul Jackson Hall thing is right after, so they can react to what is coming out of South Africa. Um, but I want to stay on the topic of a new currency here, because de-dollarization is a trend. It, ha it was heavily discussed in the mainstream media a couple of months ago. It died down a little bit, that discussion. Uh, gold price is hanging in there, so I'm, I'm expecting something is happening on the macro scale, and maybe that new currency might be it. Uh, central banks, obviously, in the East, buying up gold like there's no tomorrow. Um, you want to... Give us some more details on the currency they might be discussing. Because, well, I think there will be hints of a new currency, hints that it will be backed by gold. But I don't think anything will emerge from the BRICS summit meeting in August. The focus will be on de-dollarization, i.e. how we are going to develop our systems that exclude the dollar. So it comes back to what I said earlier, that what will probably emerge is that not only the BRICS countries but the other 25 to 30 countries that will be attending either have developed their own payment messaging systems or are in the process of so doing. That, I think, is going to be the big message that comes out of Johannesburg. The development of um, a single currency backed by gold, I don't think that they have achieved the mechanisms necessary for that to evolve. And whether it's going to be a one currency, a new currency backed by gold, or whether it will be the Remimbi and the ruble backed by gold, I don't think has yet been decided. Ah, so the focus first is de-dollarization and then subsequently how the BRICS, BRICS secretariat can develop a single currency backed by gold does not necessarily mean convertible into gold, but backed by gold. And many people don't appreciate the magnitude of both China and Russia's gold reserves. For China, it's north of 50,000 tons, of which in round numbers about half is held by Chinese households and institutions buying gold through the Shanghai Gold Exchange, with the balance being held by different Chinese ministries, including the PLA. And for Russia, exactly the same. The central bank only holds a small fraction of Russia's total reserves, which are north of 12,000 tons, with the balance being held by the company that oversees the central bank. So no direct access, in theory, 
to, to that goal to back a currency, right? If, if half of it is held by households, you can't base a currency on that, obviously, unless you conf confiscate it. But uh, I don't see that. Very no, they hard. won't. They won't do that. No. Yeah. So. No, but even so, you're talking of north of twenty-five thousand tons. Yeah. Well, in comparison, I think the U.S. has nine thousand, and Germany has well, three and a half to four. Suppo supposedly eight. Okay. That was roughly the number. As a, as a as a as an add-on, Iran has between five thousand and seven thousand tons of gold. That number never shows don't up anywhere. Don't forget. Don't. I think Iran is the next big growth country. If you look at politically what's been happening in Iran. If you look at the massive investments that both China and Russia have made in Iran, the massive investments that Saudi Arabia is giving Iran, as well as the UAE. And again, if you look at I mean, the, China's policy in Iran is very interesting. If you go back to that 25-year agreement, which was signed a couple of years ago, there was a huge sum of money, I can't remember the figure, which China would in, will, is investing in Iran's manufacturing sector and infrastructure. So what China will do or is starting to do is SO, Chinese SOEs build factories in Iran and use Iran as the exporting base given Iran's low labor costs. Interesting. Like Iran, yeah, no, I've been reading more and more about Iran, but more on the... Uh... The legal side and how they treat uh, human rights is, uh, I think, is the buzzword here. So, I'm curious how that is developing. And uh, what about human rights in in the Western world? <laughs> changing dramatically as well. <laughs> changing dramatically. So. In Iran, positively. In the rest of the uh, in the rest of the Western world, negatively. It's. That's a that's a whole different topic of discussion. We might have to get back on that. Not, one, not for today. Not for today. <laughs> uh, I want to stay on de-dollarization for a second because I, I read a comment under uh, your recent Kitco interview, actually, which is it, which is gave me a great question to ask: Is the de-dollarization trend is that an attack on the U.S. dollar or a defense against it? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, you can argue. It's it's a it's an attack, and you can argue also that it's defensive. But I think it's it goes back to the real the real question or the real point, which is that so many countries around the world have got tired of America's either you're with us or you're not with us. And if you're not with us, then we use either the dollar or our military to subject you to what we want you to do. I mean, here in the Middle East, it's very clear that they want America out, that they're saying we have matured enough, we can look after our own, our own problems, whether they be political or financial, and we can do it in a manner that is diplomatic or friendly. Instead of using the power of the dollar and America's military prowess, which actually the war over Ukraine is showing America's military prowess has limitations. 
not really effective fighting a proxy war if you're not involved yourself. Just uh... well, that's a, that's a question in itself because um, they really uh, they have boots on the ground. They pretend they don't, but they do. Um, Mercenaries. <laughs> I mean, either officially or unofficially, they are there. I mean, we know that because it's it's public knowledge now that um, American and UK special forces have been operating and have probably, probably I emphasize, been instrumental in the attacks on the Crimean bridge and even in Russia itself, with these drone attacks. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, Moscow understands this clearly. And I think the, for the moment, rather like a heavyweight boxer, they've Moscow has absorbed the punches, but the time will come when they will say enough is enough and there will be retaliation. The question is, how will they retaliate and where will they retaliate? First of all, forget about a nuclear strike. They don't need to do that and they won't do it because they've got their hypersonic technology, which is just as effective. Um, and where they retaliate may not be in Europe. Yeah, lots of other battlefields, Sudan being one of them. But um, I'm also thinking about the grain deal that's being discussed right now. I think their strikes have been really strategic, hitting ports uh, on the Danube, for example, recently. So. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because that's an interesting one as well. But uh, I think their strikes have been getting a lot more strategic lately as well. They are all strategic. Oh, Forget no. what the West is saying. I mean, the West saying that, oh, Russia bombed the cathedral in Kiev. BS. It was done deliberately <clears throat> by Ukraine to pretend it was Russia. Good PR. No, it, it, it's tough. Like si sitting here in the West and you're, you're in the Middle East trying to discern the news as well, right? So it's, uh, tw Twitter is really helpful for that. Um, so, Simon, uh, interesting discussion here. I want to get to one topic I, ju I just wrote down while you talked about they want the U.S. out of their country. And it brings in other words. Like I was traveling to South America recently and de decolonization was a buzzword I picked up there, uh, especially in Colombia. So I'm curious, like, is that a geo geopolitical trend you're following as well? And by decolonization, it's sort of what you mean. They want the U.S. out. They want to focus more on their inner strength and focus on what they what they are good at, right? Is that something you're following as well? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, basically what South America or most South American countries want is what the Gulf countries have started doing. We want you out. We're doing things our way, not your way. And I think uh, the what we will see over the next five odd years, we will see a massive enlargement of BRICS. And probably by 2030, most commodity producing countries of any significance will be members of BRICS. What then happens? So we can turn Treasury Secretaries Connolly's famous quip. The dollar is our currency, but your problem. We can turn it on his head. Because by then, BRICS will say, commodities are 
are our assets, but your problem. Interesting. I, ju I just wrote something down. I want to. I want to get back to it in a second. But uh, breaks. I think we need to come up with a new name because breaks doesn't sound inclusive enough anymore. <laughs> so. Well, that's why I call it breaks plus. Yeah. That makes sense. So until breaks changes <laughs> its own name, that's what I continue with. Yeah. Simon, I'm tremendously enjoying our discussion. I just wrote one more thing down. It's it's. I just thought of, because if you have a gold back currency, and I'm coming back to our original discussion about a, a potential BRICS currency that might be backed by gold. Really curious, if hard asset believers, mo most of them are in the US or in North America or even Europe, start trading their dollars for a new gold back currency because it might be considered a real asset. What might that set off? Huge question. Well... Because if, if they're true yeah, to their there, theory, there, 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 they should be switching. Two, two, there are two ways of looking at it. The first is, if commodity producers decide not to use dollars, which they will, and to use the new gold-backed currency, whatever it will be, then there is a massive change in their pricing and costs. Let's take one simple example, copper. Between 1980 and last year, copper prices rose four and a half times and costs by th three and a half times. If you converted costs and prices into grams of gold, prices rose by only 48% and costs by only 13%. The problem that all commodity produce, producing countries have started realizing is that all they have received for their hard assets has been a dollar that has depreciated in value. For instance, a 1980 dollar is to, what today worth just 25 cents. So the profits that have been made by commodity, producers and countries has in fact all been illusionary. And that is what I think is going to be the real change that comes out of the mega economic and financial crisis that we see starting in the mid 2020s, i.e. just a couple of years away. That's like tomorrow. Like the day, I can't believe it's already August uh, or it's the, no, July 27th. The year has flown by. So a couple of years is tomorrow, right? Um, like that de-dollarization trend, I think, could be really accelerated if, let's call them the gold bucks or the hard asset investors, even in the U.S., that will start trading their dollars for the new currency. Do you, do you see that actually happening? Like, I'm, I'm really curious, because if they're true to their theory... And then patriotism comes in as it comes into play as well. But uh, if they're true to their theory of hard assets, you want to own a gold-backed currency. You don't want to own paper money. You, you out of out of the crisis, which is probably going to last seven years. I mean, it's not seven years downhill all the way, just as nineteen twenty nine uh, to to just as the Great Depression wasn't downhill all the way, but the trend is downhill. Uh, it, it's what emerges out of that crisis that will be so important. And that's where I think it's during the crisis that BRICS will launch its gold black, gold backed currency. So 
it's happening soon, obviously. So we, we, really interesting trend to follow. Really curious what the messaging out of Johannesburg will be. Um, but l let's talk f financial policies a little bit. And maybe one question to start us off here is, how can the U.S. stop the downward trend or the trend that is happening? Do you see a way where certain financial policies or fiscal policies or anything the U.S. does besides war sort of stop that trend? The only the only way which they won't do is to completely wash out inflation. Powell is stuck between what he wants to do and what he can't do. There's a 2024 American election. And the problem is that if he's stuck to his guns to wash inflation out of the system, that in itself will lead to a depression. Because the American financial system is highly leveraged. And uh, even putting rates up to 3% was enough to cause big problems. We have within three years, we have 10 year treasuries yielding over 10%. So I think, and I would, I would say that before the end of this year, again, despite what Powell is saying, American policy will change from raising rates to not only lowering rates, but back to Q, QE with the credit taps being turned full on because America will be in a recession and the war over Ukraine will have spilled over Ukraine's borders and suddenly the markets will realize, oh, this is not a benign ending. And that's when they'll take fright. And the Fed will have absolutely no option but to reverse policy, as will the other G7 central banks. So then you start seeing the dollar um, starting its secular decline. And the second wave of inflation then emerges exasperated by energy prices soaring because of supply disruptions, food prices soaring, not only because of supply disruptions, but of weather patterns such as the Gleisberg 89-year cycle which is due to hit either late this year or next year. And 89 years ago, it caused the Midwestern Dust Bowl, which lasted for a decade. Yeah, so interesting because U.S. policies, like Southern debt crisis comes, comes to mind when I'm thinking about U.S. financial policies as well, and uh, the U.S. having to pay almost a trillion dollars just in interest to cover their debt as well. Sure, so sure. at some point, the, the word of a, or the, the theory of a US default it seems to be getting louder. Or like there seems to be more discussion around it as well. Do, how, how do you rank a, U, like a US default and then a US Southern debt crisis in that regard? Because it feels like it could be part of the de-dollarization strategy or the attack of the US dollar. Because we all know China still holds a lot of US bonds or treasuries. So yeah, hold uh, hold on, hold, hold, hold on a moment. Um, Chinese are very long-term planners, and what I was told a few years ago, I mean, maybe five years ago, is that China had hedged all its treasury holdings through the U.S. banks. So it's the banks who are holding the, the baby, not China. Okay. 
Okay, okay, that opens a whole, a whole new line of questioning because now we, we're back to the banking crisis. So, I mean, I think we could talk forever on that as well. So the question is, do you think the banking crisis is over? Because that's the next step now. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's hardly started. I mean, here, here, here is coming back to BRICS. If you go back to an interview that the Russian economist gave to a Moscow business paper about six months ago, one of the clauses in the development of BRICS's payment system is that any existing member or new member who defaults on their obligations to G7 banks or financial inst institutions will not be barred from joining BRICS. So what do you think they're going to do? <laughs> Default on one side and join the, the other party on the other side. So in interesting. Okay, so there's motivation, obviously, to sure. do that. So in interesting. Okay. Um, Simon, let, let, I want to wrap up our conversation talking about commodities. You brought it up a couple times. We discussed gold a little bit, but I know you're a copper expert as well. Um, so I want to talk copper and base metals a little bit with you. Um, wh where do you see things heading on, on the base metal side? I'm just looking at, uh, actually read uh, Anglo-American put out their financials this morning and, uh, or the last 24 hours here. And I just want to read real quick what the CEO said, and then we can discuss. But uh, he, he said that they have been surprised by how slow the reopening of China has been and the lack of stimulus that everybody expected. The good news is the Politburo in the last couple of days has indicated quite strongly they will take some action. So to frame the discussion, like uh, how does everything we've discussed and what the Anglo-American CEO just said sort of fit into the commodity discussion? Well... Uh, base metals are driven by the macro situation. You have America going into recession, despite what all the bulls say. But if you look at, for instance, if you look at the physical demand for copper, you're in recession. Uh, Europe is in recession. Physical business is awful. Um, China has come up with about 30-odd points where they say they're going to stimulate. But it's more PR than reality. The, the real issue for um, China is there debt problems with local governments and property. All that they have announced from talking to my friends in China is how can we stabilize the economy? It's not a question of stimulation. It's a question of stabilizing. So we see, using copper as the example, the trend in copper prices into the fourth quarter is downwards and significantly so. We then get central bank policies changing to easing and easing significantly with the start of dollar beginning its secular decline. So we will then get in 2024 and into 2025 a huge bull market in all base metals. But the the dance music is not going to last long. Sometime in early 2025, when the world hits 
the economic and financial buffers, then prices are going to collapse and will be in a downtrend. It doesn't mean a decline every year, but for about, about until the early 2030s, when we emerge from uh, a series of crises which won't only be economic and financial. In that seven year period, we will have internal strifes in countries, external wars. So what then emerges will be a restructured world where common sense prevails. And that's when we see the world and copper consumption going back to its trend growth rate that has been experienced since 1900 of 4% a year. That's when the real bull market starts, not now. It's interesting how you not mentioned the EV revolution, so the electrification revolution. So, Come on, that's... It, that's not what drives metal, excuse me, metal consumption. It's the macro situation. If you're, if households have to be cautious in what they spend, they don't buy cars, whether it's an EV, which actually you add up the costs, including depreciation, is more than an IC, and governments won't be able to afford these stupid policies of building inefficient wind farms and solo farms. Just the subsidies as well. At some point, we'll have to recuperate that. Well, as well the, the, so again, again, just... again, the governments won't be able to afford the subsidies. Absolutely. Simon, this was hugely insightful. A lot of food for thought. Uh, very stimulating discussion here. I really, really appreciate your time. We've been going for 45, 46 minutes now. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, where can we find more of you? Like, this is fantastic. Yeah, my website is simon-hunt.com. Fantastic. Uh, we'll, we'll link to it below as well, obviously. Uh, tremendously appreciate your time, Simon. Super Pleasure. insightful. And uh, everybody else, we hope you enjoyed this discussion. What do you think is going to happen in the next eight weeks are going to be really interesting, I think, because we have, uh, you know, the the BRICS meeting in, in Johannesburg happening, then Jackson Hole just a couple of days after that. So there could be some interesting news coming out of both events. What do you think is going to happen? And uh, also interesting question, will you trade your US dollars for the new BRICS currency if it's gold backed? Really curious one to discuss. And uh, subscribe to the channel. 80% and more of you are not subscribed who are watching. Let's change that. I want to bring Simon back on, show him that we have a great audience that is watching and to bring other phenomenal guests on as well. We really appreciate your time. Thanks for watching. Thanks for engaging with us. We'll be back with more.